Right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm just going to start by sharing my screen with you, which hopefully will work reasonably well. Let's see. Right. OK, so hopefully everybody can see the first slide, which is just the title slide. I'm going to be talking to you today about waking day and extended day curriculum. Um, what I mean when I talk about these things really is residential placements. I'm going to be talking about the circumstances where the young person or a child's needs are such that they need uh, a place in a residential school. Uh, these cases are probably the more complex cases that we see. From a local authority's point of view, they're certainly at the more expensive end. A, a residential school placement can cost anything from £100,000 a year to 150, maybe even £250,000 a year if it's a very complicated, uh, if, if the child has very complex needs. So there's a loss at stake for the local authority and of course in these cases there is a loss at stake for parents as well um, because the children who need these um, placements are the, the, at the most complex end uh, for whatever reason of the spectrum. So I'm going to start by talking to you about what the legal definition of waking day provision is. That will involve some legalese, but it can't be avoided, unfortunately, because that's the definition the tribunal has to work with. Uh, I'm then going to talk to you about the difference between extended day and waking day uh, provision, because we use both terms, but they mean slightly different things. I'm going to talk about what you as a parent need to support your case, or as a parent supporting a young person to support your case for a residential placement what you will need from the school that you have chosen uh, to support you and what you should take into account when you're looking at whatever it is the local authority is offering as an alternative. Um, and then I'll talk about the evidence that you can give as the parent of a child or a parent supporting a young person in an appeal um, in terms of how to uh, further uh, strengthen the case that you have. And then I'll talk about cases where there's an overlap between special educational needs and social care issues that might give rise to a need for a waking day curriculum. So let's start with the case law and get that out the way. Um, fortunately, the most recent definition of waking day curriculum is also the simplest and I think the neatest. So there was a case um, about a child called TW uh, back in 2016, and that case went to the upper tribunal and the upper tribunal um, looked at the definition of waking day provision and said that waking day provision only means that a person's special educational needs are such that they call for special educational provision to be delivered beyond normal hours. So what we're talking about are children or young people whose special educational needs are so complex or unusual that they need more than just a normal school day. They need to get some sort of educational provision that goes past normal school hours. So that's what we mean when we're talking about waking day provision. And normally when we ask for a residential placement, it's because a child or young person needs that kind of provision. Um, there was another case uh, in 2009 involving a young person uh, called JP and the question uh, that talked about a different sort of um, issue that talked about one reason why a child or young person might need um, waking day provision and in that case it was because JP had such a profound need for consistency um, between where he lived and where he was educated that he basically needed a residential setting because he needed to be somewhere where there was absolute consistency between where he lived and where he went to school and without that he couldn't learn. So that was what happened in the, the case of JP. So one reason for a waking day curriculum might be that the young person is just not going to learn unless there's absolute consistency, for example, in communication techniques or perhaps behaviour management techniques um, or therapeutic approaches between all, in all of the settings that they, they have to navigate. And finally, just one more case on waking day, and then we can move away from case law. Um, a case in 2012 involving um, somebody called JH, and that case was about generalisation. And uh, one of the things that the tribunal said in that case was that you might need waking day provision in circumstances where um, you are, as a pupil, you, you need to have um, therapies and activities outside of school hours which help you to translate into your home and your school and all areas of your life and functioning, the skills that you learn within the school and schoolroom. In those circumstances, a waking day may be justified. And that case also reminds us, as I think James has already said, that need is what is reasonably required. So that gives you an idea of the tribunal's approach to what waking day curriculum means. 
Now you'll sometimes hear extended day curriculum as well as waking day curriculum. When we talk about an extended day curriculum, broadly, we are talking about children and young people who need educational some educational provision outside of normal school hours, but not necessarily residential provision. Um, when we talk about waking day curriculum, normally we are talking about a residential setting, about it, or sometimes it's called a 24 hour curriculum. I always think that's slightly misleading because it can lead, for example, to local authorities objecting to uh, residential curriculum on the basis of, well, a child doesn't need to be educated for 24 hours a day. Well, you know, obviously in a residential setting, your child or young person will not be chained to a desk for 24 hours a day, but they will be getting educational provision outside of the normal school day. And then finally, um, it's sometimes also called wraparound care, which just reflects the fact that the young person is being looked after in the same setting all the time. But it's important not to get hung up on labels, because a lot of the time, once you get out of the normal school day and you're talking about a child or young person who needs provision outside of the school day, a lot of the time you're really, um, you're probably talking about residential provision, realistically speaking, because as I'll explain later, most local authorities don't really seem to have worked out a way to provide extended day provision that that a, a way of doing that that is a reasonable alternative to a residential setting okay so let's talk about what you'll need to support your case for your child firstly you will need expert evidence in this kind of case james i think has already talked about the importance of expert evidence to support a case in the first tier tribunal so that does apply across the board but i think with a waking day curriculum case you particularly need an expert who is going to be able to really persuasively and expertly um, set out why your child needs this this provision Remember, the tribunal is conscious of the fact that this provision is expensive and they are conscious of the fact that, that the children who need it are going to be at the most complex end um, of, of need. And so it's really important that you have an expert who can get that across. The expert for waking day provision will normally be an educational psychologist. In some cases where you're talking about very complex physical needs, you might be talking about um, a physiotherapist perhaps or an occupational therapist uh, in other cases where there are, there are complex health needs you might be talking about a different kind of clinician but in cases where we're talking about a special educational need normally the lead expert on waking day will be the educational psychologist if the educational psychologist thinks that your child would benefit from an assessment by another expert who could speak to waking day they will tell you a psychiatrist may also be extremely important for waking day if the reason is that your child has a generalized anxiety disorder or some other very um very very profound um, mental health issue that means they need this kind of provision now the expert must explain in their report uh, oh, sorry, I should say your expert should write a report and also attend the hearing. It is really, really important, I think, that your lead expert on waking day attends the hearing. It, it can be a difficult call because we're aware that experts do cost money um, and that it can be expensive to have them attend. And if the local authority doesn't seem to be calling very much evidence, it can be tempting to say, well, I don't know if I'll call my educational psychologist or my speech and language therapist or whoever, because the local authority hasn't called any evidence about that. But the difficulty is, I think, that the tribunal um, is very proactive. It, it's, it's, it's what we call an inquisitorial tribunal, which means that it, it doesn't just sit and look at the evidence and pick between um, the party's cases, it's proactive and it makes its own decisions about the evidence. So the fact that your expert is the only person who's written a report doesn't necessarily mean that the tribunal will accept that, that witness's report if, they don't, if it doesn't make sense to them. So I think it's important that your lead expert on waking day attends so that they can answer any questions that arise out of the report that they've written. And I think all of us on the panel have had cases where it's become clear during the hearing that the tribunal had misunderstood something in an expert report. Unfortunately, we had that expert there to explain to the tribunal why they'd misunderstood. Now, the expert must explain in their report and their oral evidence why waking day is necessary by reference to the child or young person's needs. That's really, really important. We still see occasionally um, some expert reports. I mean, I will say not, 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 not generally speaking, the experts that we're, we're familiar with, I think, or the experts that SCN legal use, but we all see from time to time expert, expert reports where the expert effectively says, I am an expert educational psychologist and in accordance with my expertise, I think this child needs a waking day placement. They, they've got to explain it more specifically than that because the tribunal is going to want to know what in your child or young person's needs 
gives rise to that need. And I've put a few examples here. I mean, I will say I'm not an educational psychologist myself or a, a clinical expert. So the, the, these, these are explanations that I have heard um, and needs that, that I have heard in hearings as justifying the need for a waking day curriculum. Um, a, a difficulty with generalisation so that the child or young person needs to be um, needs absolute consistency between settings, uh, opportunities for overlearning, um, children who are very anxious, um, they struggle with transitions, uh, they, need, they need very careful management in terms of their behaviour. So these are all reasons why a young person or child might need a waking day uh, curriculum, but there will also be other um, cases where they're required um, for, for other reasons. It will always depend on the needs of the child. Don't forget to ask your expert how long your child should be at school for. So it could be for the normal, the normal school year of 38 weeks, it could be 44 weeks. In cases where a child's needs are particularly complex, it could be 52 weeks. Um, and also, what sort of boarding frequency are we talking about? Are we talking weekly, termly? Are we saying let's let's have the child in there for 52 weeks and use our, our, our judgment and our, you know, liaise with each other to decide when the child can come home, if the child is able to come home or whether the parents should go and see the child. So that's another important question. And again, the expert needs to explain why what they have said is necessary is necessary. And also you will need to make sure that other relevant information about your child's medical history and other assessments that they have is included in the tribunal bundle. I mean, obviously, if you it, it, it slightly depends, because if you are supporting, a, if your child is a young person, perhaps they're in their 20s, you might think, well, I don't really want to put a load of assessments in from when they were six. And that's fair enough. But you do need to make sure, for example, that if your expert has referred to certain assessments, your expert might say, I've read this report from a speech and language therapist. I've read these reports from other educational psychologists. You would want to put those in your bundle to make sure that the tribunal can read them. Now, what will you need from the school that you've chosen? So you will have looked around and researched very carefully and you will have identified a school that you think can meet your child's needs. And uh, since we're talking about waking day curriculum, that will be a residential school. So what will the tribunal expect? The tribunal will expect that a residential school will have seen your child, will have carried out observations, will have produced some sort of assessment report and that they will have offered your child a place. So you will need also to have confirmation from the school that they are offering your child a place and that place is open for them. So not, not every residential school does produce an assessment report, but most of them do. And because of that, the tribunal will always ask if there is an assessment report. And because of that, as I say on this slide, if the school hasn't produced a report, it's a good idea to ask them to provide a witness statement setting out why they believe they can meet your child's needs based on their assessment of your child. Ideally, your child would have spent a couple of nights there as well. And that helps because one of the things the tribunal is always concerned about is whether a, a child or young person with very complex needs who hasn't been away from home before will be able to cope with living away from home. So that's really, really important to the tribunal. Uh, make sure that you've got the latest Ofsted, CQC reports, I ISI reports and the prospectus in the bundle. So any inspection reports relating either to the residential aspect of the school that you've chosen or to the educational aspect and their prospectus, their brochure are in the bundle as well. Now, the school will need to be able to explain how its waking day provision works. I have done some cases where the local authorities challenge has been in part, well, parents are saying they want a waking day curriculum, but we don't think this school is providing a waking day uh, curriculum. So the school needs to be ready to answer those questions. Somebody from the school should attend the hearing. Um, I'm aware that there is a small minority of schools who will say that they don't send people to the hearings. Um, that, that can cause a real problem if there's a dispute about whether your school can do what it says it can do. So, so I would say if you're choosing a school, find out early whether they will go to the tribunal or not and push them to attend. That's really important. Um, so what will schools need to explain? Well, one of the things that they commonly need to talk about is how the curriculum and learning targets um, that are worked on during school hours are carried over to after school hours. So what, what, how, how are these things going to be worked on in the evenings? Because the evenings really is the waking day, um, is, is where the waking day provision comes in. What programmes will be administered after school? Is there going to be occupational therapy? Is there going to be any element of literacy or numeracy? And how do these differ from enrichment activities? I say that because it's easy, I think, for 
a, a witness from a school who isn't necessarily experienced in the tribunal to make what they do after school sound like fun that you do with children after school because they're not in school. So, for example, a, a school could say, well, we take our children to the theatre, we take them bowling, uh, we take them to football, um, you know, we, 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 we do drama activities. But what the school needs to explain is what targets they will be working on when they do these outings. So, for example, if they go to the theatre, are they going to be using that to um, increase safety awareness in the community? Uh, if they're going out shopping, are they going to use those opportunities to help children understand what money means, uh, to help them make choices in supermarkets? Uh, are they then going to go home and cook those meals together? Are they going to use numeracy? Um, are they going to use, say, sharing a pizza to instill some basic concepts about numeracy? Um, the likelihood is that any school that offers a waking day curriculum will be doing these things, but they need to understand how important it is to break these things down very clearly for the tribunal. How will the care workers in the residential setting be um, supervised and by whom? So um, one of the things that local authorities sometimes say is, well, you're saying that it's um, a waking day curriculum and that there's educational provision in the residential setting. But we've heard that the people in the residential setting are care workers. They're not qualified teachers. They're not teaching assistants. They're care workers. So how is that different from the respite or care provision that the local authority might be able to provide at home? And again, it comes down to what are those care workers doing? Are those care workers involved in delivering educational programmes? So these are all things that the school needs to break down very, very specifically for the tribunal and for the local authority to make it absolutely clear that what is happening after school is waking day curriculum. The other question that might arise is what therapy provision is available in the residential setting outside normal school and college hours. That is really important because a lot of the time the reason that a waking day curriculum will be sought will be at least in part because the child has very complex needs and requires very flexible therapy that can be delivered across the whole of their day as opposed to just at school. And so what you don't want is a situation where you get into tribunal and then find out that actually your residential setting only has um, the therapist that your child needs on, on site for one day a week or they're around but they never go into the residential setting or something like that. So it's really important to understand exactly what therapy provision is available and um, how that will meet your child's needs. And the last question is how close is the residential provision of the setting to the educational setting? Um, and the reason I mention that is because not all residential settings will necessarily accommodate um, the children and young people who they teach on site. And I do remember one case where uh, it became clear that in fact the, it, was, it was a case where the young person was um, seeking a waking day curriculum because they struggled with transitions. And then it became clear during the hearing that the school was considering accommodating them on a site that was 30 minutes away from the educational setting. And so obviously that, that needed to be ironed out because potentially the waking day curriculum wasn't going to solve that young person's most important need. So it's really important to fully understand what the school's waking day provision actually is, how it will actually work in practice and how it will meet your child's needs. And the more that you know about that, the better prepared you will be um, to run the case. The other thing to do is look very carefully at what the local authority is suggesting instead. Key point, even if the tribunal doesn't think your child has a special educational need for waking day provision, they may still name your residential school if the local authority's proposed alternative can't meet need. So it's really important. I mean, the waking day, evidencing waking day, a need for a waking day curriculum is really important, but it's not, it's not the only thing that you need to think about. Um, so do look, I mean, James has talked about um, section I and about naming schools in section I. Do look really carefully at the local authority's proposed alternative setting. Don't just assume that it all comes down to, wake, to, to a need for waking day provision. Um, so I would say do visit the local authority's proposed setting. I know that some parents can be reluctant to do that because it feels like um, engaging with something that just isn't going to be appropriate. But if you visit anyway, and if you have your lead expert visit anyway, you're going to be in a really good position to spot the things that won't suit your child. I mean, I suppose there could be an amazing best case alternative, which is that you go and you discover that the local authority's alternative is amazing and it may suit your child's needs. But assuming that that's not going to be the case because your child needs the waking day curriculum, um, even so, if you go, you may discover all sorts of things that other people just wouldn't think of. 
I can remember doing one case where the young person and her parents went to visit the local authorities' proposed alternative and it turned out that because of her complex physical needs she wouldn't even be able to get into the building independently at the age of 19. That's a really significant thing that everybody else, including the experts, had just missed because they didn't understand her physical needs like she did and like her mum did. So that's the kind of thing that you can pick up on if you go and visit what's being on offer. Also get your lead expert to go and visit. At least get your lead expert to speak to staff there to understand what the educational provision is. What should you be looking at? Well, firstly, suitability to meet your child's special educational needs. Um, what are the staffing arrangements? How are they going to meet your child's complex needs? What about the facilities available? If your child needs very complex physiotherapy for very profound physical needs, do they have a space where they can do that? If they have a space with a bed, is that going to work? If your child needs a wheelchair that needs a particular turning circle or a particular space, is there room for your child, the wheelchair and the people who need to help her with it? What about quiet spaces? If your child has very challenging behaviour, do they have a quiet space that they can take him to if he, if, if, if he, needs, to, if he needs to calm down and self-regulate? What about the peer group? What's the peer group like? What sort, of age, what sort of class will your child be in? What sort of abilities will they have? Will they all be verbal? Will they be non-verbal? Uh, what sort of behaviour do they exhibit? Um, do, if, if you're, you, you know, uh, is, it, is, it, um, is your child going to be towards the top end of the class? Is your child going to be an outlier at the bottom of the class? All of these questions are really important. What about courses and qualifications? Does your child have any particular aspirations? Is the school going to be able to help him achieve those aspirations? And what sort of outreach, because normally in these cases the local authority is proposing a day, a day setting. Is there any outreach that the school can offer? If your child needs help during the evenings, can the school assist? And the last point um, that I wanted to deal with in relation to this is sometimes for young people, the local authority will say, well, this young person doesn't need a, a, a waking day setting because we can replicate that, because we can put them into an appropriate supported living or other um, facility. Sorry, excuse me, just for a moment. We can put them into a supported living or other, other appropriate residential facility that we have with young people who are of a suitable peer group. Um, and we can send them to a mainstream college or possibly to a, a specialist college. We can send them with help from supported living. Um, the people, the care workers at the home can provide any therapeutic programmes that are required or any educational programmes, they can be trained to do that. Well, some local authorities do try to put this kind of package together. And it's just really important to look at how they're proposing to coordinate it. Because in a residential setting, um, both the residential areas and the educational areas are all overseen by the same people and the same team working towards the same educational targets. That won't necessarily be the case in a situation where you're trying to coordinate a mainstream college and a residential setting and then care workers who might work in that residential setting who might be employed by somebody completely different. So it's, it's really important to just scrutinise exactly what the local authority is proposing, because if what the local authority is proposing won't work, you can say to the tribunal, well, you should name my school anyway, even if you don't think my child needs a waking day curriculum, you should name my school anyway, because what the local authority is proposing is just unworkable. What about your evidence? As a parent, you are the expert on your child. And in a tribunal hearing, the tribunal must give you an opportunity to speak about your child and say what you want to say about the appeal, whether you are represented or not. So what should you talk about? Well, firstly, this is a really golden opportunity, I think, that parents should take full advantage of when they can. It, I think one of the complicating factors that can arise in these cases is that most parents who end up in an appeal have had an incredibly, incredibly difficult journey to get there. They have had, in some cases, years of trying to get their child the care that they need. In some cases, they would have been through two or three appeals already. They might not have been able to get an EHC needs assessment. They might then not have been able to get a plan. They might then have, have had to wrangle about what the plan should look like. Um, and by the time they get to the appeal and the opportunity to talk to the tribunal, one of the things that you want to talk about, understandably, is how difficult the process has been and how, how unfair it has been on you and how much difficulty it has caused for you and your child in terms of progressing and coping. And that's really understandable. It's important to understand though that the tribunal is forward looking. That's what the tribunal always says. The tribunal, the tribunal will say, where are we now? 
where do we want to get to? And so it's important, I think, not to use your opportunity in tribunal to vent about things that happened in the past, but which aren't really going to change what the tribunal does next. So whilst difficulties that you've had in the past are relevant, so for example, the local authority is proposing a placement that is exactly the same as a placement that your child has had previously and it's not going to work, that's the kind of thing you want to explain to the tribunal. This is why that didn't work. Nothing has changed. It's not going to work again. But if we're talking about things like um, the local authority not responding to emails or not coming to annual reviews, that's all incredibly frustrating. And I really, you, you know, I, 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 I see how incredibly difficult that kind of non-engagement is. But it's not, it's probably not going to progress your case in front of the tribunals to dwell on that. So what, what should you talk about? Well, I think that this spot in the tribunal is a really good opportunity for you to say to the tribunal, you've heard about my child, you've seen all these findings, findings from these experts, you've seen the assessment scores, you've seen the, um, you've seen the various different um, conclusions that the experts have reached. I want to tell you about how that translates into real life. Here's what that means when I take my child out in the community. Here's what going shopping with my child is like. Here's what trying to take my child to the pier. Um, here's what here's here's what's trying trying to take my child to, um, I don't know, um, a social event is like. Here's what it's like when my child comes home from school and he has to interact with other people at home. Here's how my child interacts with 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 adults and peers. Or you might want to talk about your child's lack of peer relationships because one of the battlegrounds we, we often see in these cases is the school will be saying oh you know they seem all right at school they seem to be doing perfectly okay um the current the current placement will be saying and the parents will be saying my child get, gets no play dates my child never socializes with children out of school my child sits on his own to eat his lunch that kind of thing so i think rather than rather than going into past past um, difficulties with the local authority that won't progress the case or re or, or sort of reiterating what experts have already said because that's another thing I think that it's very easy to do to just sort of say well this is what the experts are saying I think it's really important to say this is what it's like when I take my child out into the community you've heard that my child has no awareness of danger in public here's what actually happens so, for example, I've had clients who said they can't take their children out in public because their children, um, for example, might have very profound sensory needs. They might try and dive into rivers. They might try and climb up trees. Um, they might try and run into the road. Um, they, they might go into shops and become completely overwhelmed. Um, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, how, how are you managing to parent? If you have a child, for example, who's got really profound anxiety or very challenging behaviour, and of course those two things can be very closely interlinked, how are you parenting at home to manage that? Are you in a situation where perhaps one of you has to be focused on the child with the complex needs all the time and the other siblings have to be taken care of by the other parents? Is it affecting family life in that way? These things are all relevant to the decisions that the tribunal has to make. So it's really important to use your opportunity to speak as a parent about what it's like to parent your child. Uh, and finally, just very quickly, in some cases, there will also be social care issues. So in some cases, if you have a really complex child and you find yourself in a situation where where, where, where trying to cope with, the, with your child's needs is just very, very hard at home, um, then, then it might be a situation where you want to say to the tribunal, I want my case to be in the national trial, because even if you don't think there's a special educational need for a residential placement, there's a social care need for it because we're struggling to cope at home. Now, these cases are very complicated and very sensitive and very difficult. And my advice would always be to get um, legal advice in these cases. Um, so, for example, um, in some cases, the child has very challenging behaviour. Perhaps other family members are at risk from the child's challenging behaviour. Perhaps they are when they become very, very upset and anxious, they start to threaten their siblings. Um, you know, none of this is about blaming the child with, with complex needs. We, we know that the child is not in a position to control their behaviour in this way. And the reason for that is the needs that they have. But it's still something that's relevant to the case. In cases like this, as I say, I would always say seek legal advice in those cases. And also, if there is a social care case for a residential placement, it's really important, I think, to consult an independent social worker who can help you with the recommendations that you should be looking for in the EHC plan. And you'll hear more about national trial cases, I think, from Jen Adjikum, who will be speaking later. OK, so that's what I wanted to say to you about Waking Day. Um, I think that it is uh, always be guided by your experts. 
If there is a special educational need for a waking day curriculum, it's really important to ensure that you've got your evidence, um, that you've got your evidence very well organised, that you have your school on side, that your school is going to come to the tribunal and explain what its offering is, uh, and that you have fully explored what the local authority is offering um, instead.